afternoon all. Now today I'm looking again at these 20 position rotary switches. So there are 20 click stops around the full rotation and it also has a little click switch if you press it. Now in part one of this video I was thinking, perhaps rather overthinking, a lot of the problems that I thought that I'd have uh, trying to implement one of these into an Arduino, write some software and get the individual steps of the switch to increment one way and decrement the other way a variable. So here's the switch uh, mounted onto a breadboard complete with the chicken head knob and I've wired the three pins of the switch into ground and inputs D2 and D3 of my Arduino Nano. And I've also got two pull-up resistors, which are those 10K resistors, both going to five volts. And uh, immediately above my breadboard, I've got my sketch. So here's the code that I've written to read the switch. And uh, I'm also gonna put up the serial monitor because uh, what I'm doing is I'm sending out an integer and every time you turn the knob clockwise that should increment and every time you turn it anticlockwise it should decrement. And this is the result. Um, I'm on zero. Now if I turn one click to the right, ah, okay, well <laughs> we have a problem immediately. Let's go back to my initial position. Well that's now reading one. Okay, well let's start from there. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So I mean it's not too bad. It seems to be tracking the switch reasonably well. Let's go back to zero. Now it has lost uh, a pulse or um, done a double pulse because zero is no longer where it was. So let's try this again a little bit faster. So it's not too bad, tracks it reasonably well. Now I'm going to put this back to the zero position and press reset. And that should reset the counter variable. And let's try going a bit faster. And all the way back. Now we're at minus one. So it's not perfect. It is missing some pulses and it might also be generating two pulses for one step. But it's not too bad and I was expecting it to be a lot worse than this. Now let me just explain for a moment how this works. When the switch is in its detent position, and as I say there are 20 spring-loaded detent positions in one rotation, the two outputs are open circuit, they're disconnected from the ground pin, and because there are pull-up resistors, on this board the pull-up resistors are actually fitted on the board, but when you're using the switches loose you have to put pull-up uh, resistors on the breadboard, which I've done. Um, they pull both the A and the B inputs. Now these are arbitrary names because um, although this says clock and data, it doesn't matter, they can be either way around. They're both pulled high. So the detent position is shown by this line. It's one, one. Now as you move through the patterns, now this would be clockwise turning of the knob and anti-clockwise would be moving back the other way. We go through the four codes, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and then back to 1, 1, and this would be another detent position. Now if I use A as clock and B as data, and I look for a rising clock edge, then if we're traveling in this direction, the rising clock edge is here. The rise, if I look for the rising clock edge, my data is low. And of course, if I'm traveling in this direction, that's a rising clock edge. This is a rising clock edge. I'm, I'm low, then I go to high. So in this direction, on the rising clock edge, data is high. In this direction, on a rising clock edge, the data is low. And that's what indicates the direction that you're turning the knob. So the software needs to say, look for this rising edge and then measure the level on the other pin. Now how do we find a rising clock edge? Well the way to do it is just to keep continually measuring this data input 
but as quickly as you can. And when you see the rising clock edge, the read will be high, but of course it will also be high at each measurement along here. So what you want is that the read of the date of the clock line is high, but that the previous read is low. And that means that that was your previous measurement. This is your now measurement and a change of state occurred between those two measurements. So I've got two variables, clock state and last clock state. And at the bottom of the code, last clock state is set to clock state. So in this part of the code, we've got uh, the clock state now after we do a digital read of clock and the clock state as it was in the last read. Now, I'm saying if the last clock state was low, but this clock state is high, then we know we have a rising edge. Then we read data. And if data is low, we increment the count variable, else we decrement the count variable. So a change of state in the positive direction or clockwise direction increments the count variable. And a change of state in the anti-clock direction decrements the variable. And that all works if you go very slowly and if you don't fiddle about between two states too much because you can see there that it jumps from naught to three. So it's a little bit jittery in that transition phase. And if you don't go fa too fast, watch what happens if I turn this knob really quickly by about 10 pulses. Well, it actually read minus four. That's very bizarre. Let's go back to zero. Let's reset it. So that's zero. I'll go fast, but not quite as fast. About half a turn, so that's 10 steps. And it only registered four. So the point is, it's missing steps if I turn the knob too fast. And the reason that's happening is because this loop code uh, has a one millisecond delay in it. So it can only execute at the fastest about a thousand times a second. And because of all the time it takes to do all this, it's going to be slower than that. And in fact, this serial print line piece of code takes a certain amount of time to actually pass information back over the serial and the USB back to the computer to uh, bring up that serial monitor. Let's put that back on. There's the serial monitor. Let's just move that into position where you can see the number at the bottom. Now, at 9600 board, what's that? About 10,000 bits per second. So 10 bits per byte. So it's about 1,000 bytes per second. So writing to the serial monitor is at least another millisecond, possibly even two if it sends a, a carriage return or a new line. So this piece of code is only executing um, possibly only t uh, f 500 times a second or even as little as 300 times a second. So if I turn this knob so that pulses occur faster than around 300 times a second, really quick. It just misses most of those pulses. There we only managed to catch one. Now if I turn it back slowly, of course, it's gone to a much more negative value than it should be. It should be zero at this point. Now let's make the problem massively worse. Instead of that one millisecond delay at the bottom here, I've put in what all good Arduino programs should have, a flashing LED. So it goes, uh, pin 13 goes high for 500 milliseconds and then low for 500 milliseconds. But now, instead of this thing going around the loop um, once every two or three milliseconds, it goes around the loop at least a thousand milliseconds. It's locked into this flashing part of the code here for a whole second. Let's open the serial monitor. So now you can see on the serial monitor, here are my uh, numbers clocking up, but they only clock up once per second because, as I say, the Arduino is locked into this code. And it's going to be extremely difficult for me to get the Arduino to see these switch pulse movements at all. If I just keep moving it and hope it sees something, every second it sees something. But of course it's just missing almost everything I'm doing. And so if you put a flashing LED based on software delays addition to this code, the switch reading code just completely falls apart. So the point is long software delays like these half second delays and a highly responsive piece of code to try and see the movements of this switch are completely incompatible. This is terribly bad coding, of course, but it just shows that uh, 
the more code you put into this loop to do other things, the more it would adversely affect the reading of this switch. And that's because we're reading this switch using a technique called polling. Now there is a solution, and that's to use interrupts, and I will cover that in the next part of this video. So all in all, I was quite surprised at how well this works, uh, as long as you don't bulk your program out with uh, ridiculous timing delays for flashing LEDs. It tracks the uh, switch reasonably well. Now, if you do turn it very, very quickly by flicking it around like this, it misses pulses, that's inevitable. Interrupts can solve that, so we'll definitely look at that next time. But did you notice that um, that time when I switched it between two points and it kind of jumped up two or three numbers, that is down to switch bounce, or maybe not even switch bounce, noise on the contacts of these switches. And that, I think, is going to be a much harder problem to solve. But I will attempt to do it. I'm not going to give up just yet.